The last thing they said before I walked in the room was the instructions on how to use the mic, and I realized I was about to t start talking without following the instructions. So anyway, uh, welcome to Cantini. My name is Paul Herbert. I'm the director of the First Division Museum. Obviously, we're not in the First Division Museum tonight. Uh, we have we just took down the uh, summer exhibit that some of you may have seen on Bill Malden, and we're still kind of in disarray in there. So we've moved over here to the theater for the uh, visitor center. For those of you, I know that a lot of you have been to many of these programs, but there are some people who have not, and we might have some first-time visitors. So you're at Cantini, and Cantini is the historic estate of Colonel Robert R. McCormick, our benefactor. Uh, Colonel McCormick was uh, a veteran of the First Division in World War I and was absolutely devoted uh, to the division and soldiers and veterans uh, for the rest of his life. When he passed away in 1955 uh, with no kids, he left his entire fortune, uh, $55 million at the time, uh, to establish our parent organization, the Robert R. McCormick Foundation in Chicago, a major philanthropy. And he took this estate and he said, uh, leave this as a public park for the people of Illinois and uh, create a museum here to my beloved First Division. And that's why we're here. Uh, it's fortuitous because the First Division has been on continuous active duty uh, since June of 1917. There's not a day that has gone by that the men and women of the Big Red One have not been serving the United States. And currently they're deployed in Afghanistan. Uh, the headquarters of the Big Red One is RC East. The 4th Infantry Brigade is, uh, is in RC East. Uh, and several of its other elements are deployed, and they've had countless deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so that's why the First Division Museum, Cantini, McCormick, McCormick was the owner, publisher of the Tribune. That's how all those disparate pieces uh, fit together. Uh, we do these public programs because we think it's in America's interest that uh, our citizens know something about military affairs. And so we have a variety of programs that many of you are familiar with, uh, such as the one we're going to present tonight. And uh, if we are a democracy and the people are ultimately responsible for the security of the country, then we all got to know something about that. And we offer these lectures uh, in that uh, vein. Uh, it's a great privilege to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, he and I are roughly contemporaries. Uh, and actually crossed paths once or twice when we were both on active duty in the United States Army. Uh, Doug McGregor is a retired colonel. He's a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point. He had a long and distinguished career as an armor and cavalry officer. Uh, he is a decorated combat veteran, uh, as is obvious from his topic tonight, which is uh, uh, based on firsthand experience. Uh, he has a Ph.D. in International Relations from the University of Virginia. Uh, he is the author of a seminal work with which some of you may be uh, familiar. It was called Breaking the Phalanx, and it was a recommendation for radical reform in the United States Army. Uh, at the time that it came out, it was highly unpopular. Uh, Doug uh, uh, took tremendous personal and professional risks to put his honest thoughts in paper. But many people would credit that book with being the intellectual foundation of the organization of the Army today based on brigade combat teams instead of um, line divisions. Um, there's a lot more to say about that, and, and Doug may talk about it, uh, and uh, we could uh, talk about it uh, afterwards. Uh, he uh, has served in a variety of capacities uh, just a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago, I guess. Uh, we were doing some work with our staff on the First Division's role in the Balkans, in which uh, Doug played a principal role on the personal staff of General Wesley Clark, who was at that time the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe and relied heavily on Doug's uh, intelligence, uh, insight, uh, and uh, capability. Um, uh, for personal advice in the conduct of those uh, campaigns. He is a frequent guest on television and radio news shows and uh, it says here is the lead partner of the Potomac League LLC in Reston, Virginia. 
Um, so without further ado, it's uh, a great privilege for me to introduce a distinguished author and soldier, Doug McGregor, to talk to us about his book, Warrior's Rage, The Great Battle of 73 Easting. Doug. Uh, the principal challenge for the next hour is to see whether or not I can effectively uh, utilize instruments uh, at the podium to move things around and make slides change and so forth. Like a second. of expanding and extending that achievement, which is being with us now for many years, thanks to Mr. McCormick, or Colonel McCormick, I should say. And uh, secondly, J.D. Comas, uh, who's the man who's handled my trip. J.D. is in the back of the room, and I, I appreciate very much uh, your efforts to bring me here. I did serve in the 1st Infantry Division, though I was not privileged to serve with it in combat. I commanded the 1st Squadron, 4th Cavalry, the Division Cavalry Squadron in the 1st Infantry Division. So this is a special pleasure for me to be here with the Big Red One. And I want to thank you. I know that you could all be watching yet another political convention. Uh, <laughs> what a terrible thing to do to take you away from that uh, special experience. I love leaving Washington because whenever I leave Washington, I am stunned uh, at how nice and friendly and pleasant Americans are. Uh, it, it's, you know, Washington is, is a planet unto itself. And I finally concluded that the principal problem with Washington, D.C. are the politicians that reside there. H.L. Mencken said that uh, politicians were the only form of animal life on the planet that could sit on the fence and keep their ears to the ground at the same time. <laughs> and it's been my experience with most of the politicians that I've had the misfortune to work with over the years in Washington that if they discovered that there were cannibals in their respective districts or states, they would promise them missionaries for dinner. Uh, so I am, I'm not a fan of the political process. I'm rather tired of it. And I'm so happy to be here and not in front of the television set watching people say things that are utterly ridiculous. Uh, especially, uh, I think it was H.L. Macon who said that, uh, you know, politics is like going to church. People sit there who want to go to heaven listening to someone tell them about a place he's never been to, knowing full well that no one in the audience will ever get there. Uh, that's a, that's a, a good summation of politics, in my judgment. So, not much we can do about that. There are some very important reasons I'm here this evening, though, quite aside uh, from, from the rest of it that I've mentioned thus far. It's hard for us today to really appreciate the hallowed ground that you are standing on. World War I was conceivably the most destructive war in terms of human life uh, in, in human history. And we suffered terribly in that war. In 110 days of fighting, 110 days of fighting in 1918, we sustained 318,000 casualties, of which 110,000 men died. Do the math. Do the math. 110,000 dead in 110 days of fighting. That kind of lethality today is almost incomprehensible to us. We toss around this word war frequently. We talk about war in Afghanistan, war in Iraq. Well, it's war for a very small number of people, less than 15% of the soldiers and Marines and sailors who actually deploy to the theater ever experience anything remotely like war, ever come under direct fire, may in fact see a mortar round. It's not like World War I. We need to remember that because in the future, the lethality that I'm going to discuss today is a glimpse of the lethality that awaits us in future wars against enemies who have real armies, real air forces, real air defenses, and real naval power because a lot of what I'm going to discuss this evening with you is about that kind of lethality. 
So when you think about the future, think about the First World War, the kinds of losses that we took, that's what lies ahead at some future point in time. 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, it's hard to tell. But it's out there, it's waiting for us. That's the kind of warfare I'm gonna talk about tonight. The losses in the First World War created the foundation for the armored force, which is the other subject of tonight's presentation. Doesn't get much attention these days. We hear lots about men with rifles riding around on wheels, winning hearts and minds. Well, that's largely mythological in my judgment, the hearts and minds bit. But the second part of it, the men with rifles on wheels, we've been there before. That happened to us in 1950 in Korea, when we had lots of men with rifles, with very little war fighting equipment, some artillery, and we suddenly discovered that we were faced with thousands upon thousands of North Korean troops, organized much like the Mongol armies and equipped with 300 brand new T-34 tanks and copious amounts of artillery. We were very ne nearly driven into the sea. We were almost annihilated. That's another reason I'm here tonight, because the armored force inside the United States Army is in decline. It's in decline because of this fiction that war has changed, that war is different, that war does not involve the kind of lethality that Colonel McCormick witnessed on the battlefields of the First World War. It does. It's there. It will be back. And the kind of fighting that we engaged in, the kind of force that distinguished itself in 1991 in the space of a few hours is frankly speaking the kind of force with the right lethality and protection and mobility that we are going to need in the future for that fight that's waiting for us out there. Remember Plato, only the dead have seen the end of war. We will fight again, ladies and gentlemen, and we will be surprised when it strikes and even more surprised at whom we fight. It may turn out to be in a different place at a different time from anything we've anticipated, much as Korea was in 1950. And that's the other reason I'm here, because I'm an advocate for the armored force. Armor is the foundation for offensive combat on land. Armor allows you to break through the enemy. It allows you to encircle the enemy, whether that enemy is mounted, dismounted, modernized or not, and destroy that enemy. It allows you to strike deep into the enemy's territory, hold his capital hostage, hold his population at risk, destroy his capacity for self-defense, and compel him to capitulate. That's what the armored force does. That's how the armored force wins hearts and minds. Now, let's see if I get this to work right. Ah, there we go. Now to the presentation. This is really a study in leadership, competence, and mobile armored firepower. Uh, it was a remarkable group of people that I was fortunate to lead, and I'm going to talk a little bit about them and about their nature, their character, as well as their equipment. Because in the ultimate analysis, it is the combination of people with technology within the right organizational framework that maximizes the potential of the people and their technology that wins in battle. That's what the Second Armored Cavalry Re Regiment represented in 1991. Now, just as a little bit of background, uh, I'm sure you've heard people say, well, you know, our, our mission really wasn't to remove Saddam Hussein. We really didn't go there for that purpose. Uh, oh, the Republican Guard was supposed to escape so that we could prevent the Iranians from intervening in Iraq. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, read the screen. These are the orders that we received, the top in November 1990 and down here on the bottom. Our mission was unambiguous. It was to find and destroy the roughly 90 to 100,000 men in the Republican Guard Corps equipped with the best Soviet equipment that Saddam could buy, destroy them, and be prepared to attack to Baghdad. That was the mission. Please don't lose sight of that. Now, what did people think in 1990-91? I mean, some of you can probably remember the, the uh, 
discussions that went on in the press, uh, people who testified on the Hill. Uh, I remember some of the testimony. I watched it on the BBC before deploying in November of 1990. And I think I saw several people, some of them were named Depew, the Depew brothers who used to uh, calculate uh, anticipated casualties and they would do force ratios and they would count numbers and they would say, well, based on the numbers of, a, of artillery systems and tank systems and equipment, we anticipate several thousand casualties within the first week and on and on and on. <coughs> so at the top, here is the official third US Army headquarters. That was the commanding headquarters on the ground at the time. And they were estimating 20,000 casualties in the first five days of fighting. Imagine that. Well, here's an insight for you, ladies and gentlemen. During World War II, the armored force, only 10% of the casualties taken by the United States Army in action during World War II were taken by the armored force. Of that 10%, 1% were fatalities. What does that tell you about armor? Even when it may not be the best, what does it tell you about the firepower and the mobility on that armored platform? It tells you that there is safety and survivability 